Welcome to the Hack the Entrepreneur Top 10, where we dive into the 10 most popular, deepest diving, and most transformative interviews from over 200 of the world's most interesting and brightest entrepreneurs. To get the full experience and to hear new episodes every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, visit hackthentrepreneur.com. Welcome to Hack the Entrepreneur, the show which reveals the fears, habits, and inner battles behind big name entrepreneurs and those on their way to joining them. Now here is your host, John Naster. Hey, hey, this is Hack the Entrepreneur. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am your host, John Naster, but you can call me Johnny. My guest today is one of the top professional biz speakers in the world. I have six of his books on my shelf in my office right now, and I've been reading them for, I think, almost 20 years at this point. Beyond that, though, he is the author of more than 70 books, many of them bestsellers. He's the chairman and CEO of Brian Tracy International, a company specializing in the training and development of individuals and organizations. His goal is to help you achieve your personal and business goals faster and easier than you ever imagined. He has consulted more than a thousand companies and addressed more than five million people in 5,000 talks and seminars throughout the US, Canada, and 55 other countries worldwide. As a keynote speaker and seminar leader, he addresses more than 250,000 people every single year. Now, let's hack Brian Tracy. FreshBooks makes dead simple cloud accounting software that's transformed how five million entrepreneurs deal with their day to day paperwork. As the exclusive sponsor of Hack the Entrepreneur's Top 10, FreshBooks is sharing their top 10 tips on how entrepreneurs can save time, reduce stress, and make their business run more smoothly. Tip number four, stay on top of your expenses to avoid mountains of stress at tax time. You can link FreshBooks to your credit and debit cards and import your expenses automatically. So next time you expense that business lunch or tank of gas, watch it magically appear straight into your FreshBooks account. This is only a fraction of what FreshBooks can do for you. To get 30 days free to feel the full effect of FreshBooks on you and your small business, go to freshbooks.com slash hack and enter hack in the how did you hear about us section. We are back with another episode of Hack the Entrepreneur. And today we have a very, very, very special guest. Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's very happy to be here. Oh, I'm absolutely honored to have you. All right, Brian, let's jump into this. Brian, as an entrepreneur, can you tell me what is the one thing that you do that you feel has been the biggest contributor to your successes so far? It's not only me, but it's what every single entrepreneur does from Richard Branson with 82 companies down to the first successful entrepreneur is they see an opportunity, a market opportunity to offer a product or service can really help people to improve their life or work. And it turns them on. I am now sort of like an information entrepreneur. I do seminars and workshops all over the world. And I have something like 33 days of different workshops. Every one of them is triggered by seeing or hearing of companies or people that need information or ideas on a particular subject. I did a two-day program called How to Start, Build, Manage, or Turn Around Any Business, which was rated as by Nightingale Conant and by others as the best single audio program on starting and building small businesses ever done. And why? It's because I thought entrepreneurs really need an enormous number of tools that they just don't get accidentally. How to think, how to plan, how to market, how to hire how to fire, how to, how to negotiate bank loans, even leases. There's so many things that the entrepreneur is unaware of when they start off. So after 20 years, I put all of this stuff together in one place because I felt there was a huge need for entrepreneurs. Every book I write is the same thing. So the way an entrepreneur becomes successful is they see a need for a product or service that can improve or enrich the lives of a particular customer. And then they throw their whole heart into producing that product. Oh, I love it. I love it. And so how do you, how do you find those needs now? I mean, now with you, I mean, you have a massive audience and like, 
a whole, like I'm sure just thousands of people that ask you questions and you can kind of get a feel for it. But how did you say create your first product? How did you, did you find one person or did you have that need and just make it that you assumed other people did? Great question. I read Inc. Magazine. I think every entrepreneur should read Inc. And they do the Inc. 500 and the Inc. 5000 every year. Fastest growing companies. Last year, they asked, you know, all the founders of the Inc. 500 and they asked them, why did you start this business? And almost every single one of them said, I started the business because I like the product and I wanted the product for myself and my family. My son, David, he lives in Las Vegas. He works in real estate. He came up with this idea of this drink and he calls himself the tonic master. And this drink is made with lemon juice and garlic and Tabasco sauce. And I say, because I take it every day, I say, David, taking this drink is a religious experience. Because when you take it, you say, oh, God, Jesus, God, Jesus, because it is so strong. But he says, this solves every problem in your body, grows your hair, solves your joints, gives you energy. I mean, he is so excited about this product. He mixes it up like a mad scientist in his, in his room. He puts it in bottles. He gives it to his friends. He drinks it himself. That's classic entrepreneurship. Now, I'm just reading something this morning. It says about the unicorns. The companies that start up and go over a billion dollars in valuation in a short period of time, and there's now 150 of them or more in the U.S., 32 more this year, according to Forbes magazine. And so they, they looked at the unicorns, and they said, these people try, and they give two examples. One, try 20 different ways of doing the business before they found the business model that worked. The other one tried 34 times. 34, they said, it, it is incredible the high rate of not failure, but basically mistakes that you make at the beginning. So the rule is fail fast, learn quickly, try again. Fail fast, learn quickly, try again. And entrepreneurs have that mindset. It's company people are used to doing a job. They pick it up from here and they do the part and they send it on to there. Very much like an intellectual production line. But entrepreneurs have to try this, try that, try this, try that, try this, try that. And the only thing that counts is the customer. So we say the first thing you do, and this is the you know, the four stages of the epiphany, the lean startup. This is the, the, the future is first thing you do is proof of concept. Got an idea? Find a customer and tell the customer, if I produce a product like this that does this, will you buy it? And until you, until you have that, you don't put any money into it. And then you take it back to them when you have it to the next stage and say, how do you like it? How do you like me so far? And you keep doing that until the customer says, I really like this product. I'll buy it. How much is it? How much can I, how many can I have? So that's, that's the future of entrepreneurship. Yeah, I love it. And I love the try 20 things first, because as your son's case, like as, is it the tonic guy you said? Yeah, he calls himself the tonic master. The tonic, David, the tonic master. I, I, so I want that recipe, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll look him up. But, but in your, in your son's case, we all want that. We all want that product that we're so passionate about, yeah. but we don't necessarily have like it doesn't just appear. No. So I love that idea of it. Tr you have to try 20 things before you might find that unicorn. That's it. Like you can't just stand still and wait for that idea. You got to kind of start, right? Yeah. And you have to kind of get that momentum going yes. and then try a thing and a thing and a thing. And eventually you will find your unicorn. Yes. And if you believe in it, what will happen is that you, it'll give you the energy to just go over bump after bump. If you don't have that energy of desire, too many entrepreneurs, as you know, are looking for a product where they can make a fast buck. And so they think, well, isn't that something I would use, but I could sell this to a lot of people and make some easy money. Never happens. These people, if they are successful in the short term, they lose it all in the long term. And they're right back to where they started. But you know the story of the, of the yogurt. I wish but my mind is blank. But the guy who came up with the Greek yogurt, the immigrant, he right, loved right. Yes, he loved Greek yogurt. What's Anyway, he started to mix it up in his house and take it around in little jars to nearby stores and have them try it out. And it cost twice as much. And they said, no, oh, nobody would ever eat it. They would eat it and they were putting a line up. We need more. We want more. Before the dust had settled, here's this little guy. He buys a bankrupt yogurt factory owned by Dannon or one of the big companies and the huge guy. And he makes Greek yogurt. He's now a billionaire. Every store in the world carries his yogurt. We have, I just looked in my store, my, my refrigerator, 
we got a 15 containers of his yogurt of different flavors, and everybody's crazy about this Greek yogurt. They pay twice as much for the same quantity. But the reason he started it was because he loved the flavor of Greek yogurt, and he couldn't find it in the U.S. I love it. I love it. I love it. So, Brian, we need to go back a bit if we can, because... Looking back, there seems to be this time in every entrepreneur's life when they realize one of two things. Either they have this calling to make this huge difference in the world, or they somehow just found that they're become sort of unemployable and can't work for somebody else anymore. And I would love to know which side of the fence you see yourself on, and if you could take us back to when you discovered this about yourself. Well, some people, be we all start off as employees. If we're very fortunate, but I, when I was a young man, and this is a, so sort of a thing that happens, is my parents didn't have any money. So at the age of 10 years old, I was going from door to door offering gardening services, hoeing weeds, uh, cleaning gardens, yards, and carrying stuff and so on. Age of 10 years old. So I was, in a way, forced to become an entrepreneur. And then people needed lawns mowed. So I, I got an old a lawnmower and I began to push it around the neighborhood to mow lawns. And it was so successful, I went out and got a brand, got a beautiful lawnmower and put it on a little cart and, and towed it behind my bicycle. And that became so successful, I got an electric edger so that I could actually mow lawns and edge them and trim them as beautifully as a professional gardener. I mean, almost like a golf green. I had this classical professional lawnmower that threw the grass forward so that it left no blemish on the lawn at all. And then I got a paper route and then I sold Christmas trees and so I, I was forced at a young age to be entrepreneurial. Today, most people don't. They, they're taught. And I took an MBA degree in my 30s. And all they teach you in the MBA degrees is how to go out and get a job and be a good employee. So most people have the employment mentality. Most people become entrepreneurs when they find themselves no job, no prospects, got to make money, got to sell something. That's how people get into sales is they can't get a laboring job. I always joke with my audience. The reason you got into sales is because you couldn't find a laboring job. You know? <laughs> and they go, oh. <laughs> and I said, but all successful entrepreneurs are very good at selling. But if someone starts an entrepreneurial company, but they can't sell, it's like the dot bomb thing that happened in the uh, 2001. He said, all these companies started up with all these people with ideas who had never sold anything. And they called them all pre-revenue companies. Pre-revenue. <laughs> now that we've got 600 people and $50 million worth of venture capital, and we haven't sold anything yet. So what good companies do, and I was just asked this recently, and I've studied it exhaustively, is they bootstrap. They start off like this yogurt guy, and what they do is they make a little bit out of their savings, they borrow some money, make a little bit and sell it, take the profit and reinvest it, take the profit and reinvest it. So now he's got a plant that's virtually paid for, and he's a billionaire, producing a product that he loves, but he started off with nothing except his own ambition. Another thing about entrepreneurs is they're willing to fail fast, as I said before, but also the quality of entrepreneurship is initiative. That's the big difference between employees and entrepreneurs, is employees uh, wait to be told what to do, and then they do it, but successful people take the initiative. They see something that needs to be done, and they damn well do it. I was on a Disney cruise. It's a wonderful experience. If you go to, go to Walt Disneyland or a Disney cruise, Walt Disney, in 1947, visited a place called, in Copenhagen, called, da, 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 it's, a, it's a sort of a central amusement park in Copenhagen. It's very famous. The name just escapes me. And he was sitting there with his brother and his wife. They're sitting there on a bench. And he said, you notice anything about this amusement park? And there's restaurants and rides and peoples and families and everything else. And they said, no, what? He said, it's impeccably clean. There's no dirt, not a matchstick, no paper, nothing. It's clean. And there's people roving, picking up stuff. He said, you know, all the amusement parks in America are dirty. There's popcorn and garbage and toffee and Coke bottles and everything else. He said, what if we were to do something like this in America? So he came back, and that was the beginning of the idea that, of the founding of Disneyland in Anaheim when it was surrounded by truck farms, just all farms. So he was able to buy cheap land way out in Anaheim to build the first Disney. So you go on to a Disney cruise, it's the same thing. You can go into any Disney property and it's meticulously clean. You can eat off the ground. You can eat off the floor. And I remember on this Disney cruise, and it's expensive, it's more expensive than normal, is the, the executives, the, the ship's officers, the pursers walking in uniforms, they walk around and they're very friendly and everything else. And they're like ravens. If they see a French fry, 
or a matchstick anywhere. They zoom and they pick it up. Wow. And there's never wow. anything. So they go into the, the cafeteria where the kids are buying French fries and, and spilling everything else. And you see the Disney staff, like birds. It's, everything is clean up. There's never a spot on the floor. I mean, that's the mentality of people who love their work. They're willing to do anything. And they take the initiative. That was my point. They don't wait and say something for somebody to tell them to go and pick it up. They, they just do it. They just go sh- straight in and do it because it's part of their mindset. Yeah. And in your new book, which I absolutely love, Get Smart, you have that entrepreneurial thinking. You have a small section, entrepreneurial thinking versus corporate thinking. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you have 10 chapters. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. And it's, it's so, like, to me, you can, you can work in corporate America and you can have a great job and you can hope to step out and start your own business. But I think it's impossible if you don't first have entrepreneurial thinking within your job. Yeah. I think because you clearly lay out what corporate thinking is and anybody with corporate thinking will never make that leap because it's too far out of them. Yes. So do you see that as sort of the stepping stone to... Here's the great thing. Then they studied, by the way, people who left corporate America to start their own business and came reeling back in shock and just grabbed on like a drowning man onto a, a paying job. And they found that in large companies, there's other people to do most of the stuff. In a small company, it's only you. You have to unlock the door. You have to empty the waste baskets. You have to make the phone calls. You have to go and see the customers. Very often, you have to manufacture the product and take it to the customer and get paid. This is the price you pay. This is this idea, you know, earning your bones, as they say, is the price you pay to be a successful entrepreneur is you do dog work for a long time. And what happens is so many people who've worked with large companies, the shock of having to actually do dog work, answer their own phone, reply to their own emails, go and pick up stuff and deliver the stuff is such a shock to their system. They cannot do it. And they just reel back and go back to a much lower level of income, a much lower potential future but at least they're safe and secure and they don't have to do that little stuff. So an entrepreneur is willing to do whatever it takes. And this is one of the most important expressions. What will you do? Whatever it takes. How long will you work? As long as is necessary. How many days a week? As many days as necessary. Do you know that successful entrepreneurs work an average of about 60 hours a week? And in starting the business, it's not unusual to work 70 or 80 hours. That means 10, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, sometimes for weeks and months. When I started my first business, I finally started this business, I was working 12-hour days, seven days a week, right to the point where I was literally physically exhausted by Saturday or Sunday, and I'd be up working on Sunday to catch up. I was exhausted, so much so, I developed deep black bags under my eyes, and I was tired for months, but it was an opportunity, and it's like grabbing the ball in a football game. You don't say, well, I'm a little bit tired right now. No, you run for yards. And I got, I got such black bags, I eventually had to have plastic surgery to have my face fixed because I, wow. I was so exhausted. And, there's, and my eyelids started to droop and my eyes were black. And finally, somebody said, you know, you look like you stand up. First thing in the morning, you look exhausted. <laughs> so, so I finally went to a plastic surgeon. Never done that in my life. And the plastic surgeon, they have surgery that will actually clean your face, make it brand new, take away all the bags, tighten up your eyelids, everything else. The whole thing takes an hour or two. It lasts for life. And then the day after I came, I had the plastic surgery, my clients were saying, holy smokes, I can't believe it. So it's no nick, nip, and tuck. They're not putting in stitches in a wind tunnel, you know, but they can just clean up your face and do, do beautiful things. But, but I worked so hard that I was just exhausted. And That's not unusual. I know lots of people are like that. If people are thinking they're going to work 40 hours a week, there's a joke in entrepreneurship. When you start your own business, you can only, you only have to work half time and you can pick whichever 12 hour period per day that you like. (laughs) I love that. I love that. And I guess this goes back to why you also need to have that passion, right? Like your son, again, you have to, because otherwise you'll never push through. You'll never. You have to love the product. Yeah. Here's, here's, here's my favorite story from Inc. It's a two immigrant couples, husband and wife with little kids, and their business grew over three years, 42,000%, 4,200 times in three years. They were the leaders in the world in terms of fast growth. What was their business? Well, they got an iPad, all right? 
and they wanted their kids to get good grades, okay? So they went to the school and they said, could we put our kids' lessons, their kids are in third, first, second, third, fourth grade. Could we put the kids' lessons on the iPad and then could we put the kids' favorite television shows on the iPad? So they learned out how to do this, okay? Like a Netflix sort of thing. And so they brought their kids home and they say, you do a certain amount of homework, you watch, get to watch a certain amount of kid show, a certain amount of homework, a certain amount of kid show. Classic motivational theory. So they started to do that. The kids could hardly wait to get home to do their homework. And then they watch the kid show and it's over. Got to do more homework to get the kid show. The kids were so wired. They went from average students to straight A's. They literally were the, the champion kids in the school. At the PTA meeting, one of the parents said, how come your kids get straight A's all the time? I mean, they're just ordinary kids. And they said, well, we developed this little technology for our kids, you know, husband and wife working back and forth next door. And they said, can we have that? Can we want our kids to get good grades. And they said, sure, we bring over an iPad and we'll show you how to do it. And so then the other parents said, hey, can we have that? Can we have that? It went out like Jungle Telegraph to all the schools and every parent who wanted their kids to get good grades at school. And, you know, getting good grades at school in your formative years sets you up to get good grades for the rest of your life. It sets up a field of expectations. I expect to get good grades, as opposed to if you get poor grades when you start off, that becomes your field of expectation. And usually you do poorly throughout school. So what happens? Parent after parent after parent, boom, went out, boom, boom, boom. And it was on radio shows and talk shows and everything else. They grew 42,000%. Everybody wanted it. And they started it off for themselves, for their little kids, only because they just loved their kids and they wanted their kids to get good grades. It's a perfect story and perfectly true. I love it. I love it. And I love the successes of it. But with the successes, as you've mentioned already, before that and during that process comes failures. And we can talk about your successes all we want, but I'm sure you've had probably even daily to this point where you think of something and try it and it doesn't quite work out, right? As entrepreneurs, as human beings even, one of our greatest struggles is that fear of being wrong, making a mistake right. and failing. Brian, could you walk us through how to be wrong within your business? Okay, a, a friend of mine told me this many years ago, Mark Victor Hansen is a motivational speaker. And we were talking about that and it, I, I don't know where it came up, but he said, the key is to get it 80% right and run with it and then fix it up as you go along. Get it 80% right. And I, up to that time, I was a perfectionist. I wanted it to be absolutely perfectly right before I would launch with it. And that's what most people do is it's ready, 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 aim, 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 never, never fire. And so from then on to this, if I get a good idea for a book, a course, a training program, an audio video, everything else, I get it and run it up the flagpole and get it and get the feedback and get the cannons coming back at you. And then I correct it and run it back up. I correct it and run it back up. Every multi-million dollar successful product I've ever had has been preceded by a whole series of failures. But the key is launch. And they did a study at, at Babson College, which has the, one of the best MBAs on entrepreneurship in the world. Very famous for that. And they followed and they tracked their graduates for about 12 years after they graduated from Babson College to see what happened. And they found that 90% of them went to work for wages. And the other 10% started their own businesses and were vastly much more successful. And so they went back and said, what was the difference between the 90% that had this fabulous entrepreneurial degree? The MBA thesis at Babson is a complete business plan where you do your research and you actually plan the starting of a business. When you walk out of Babson College, you have your business plan, you're ready to, to launch the day after. So why is it 90% went to work for wages? Well, one thing is that companies hire Babson graduates at very high pay right out of the gate. But the other thing was the 10%. So they looked at the 10% and they found that there were no difference in grades, skills, ability, intelligence, anything. But he said they did one thing as they launched, is they, they got an idea that instead of overanalyzing it, they just launched. And then they learned as they went along. The other 90%, always intended to start their own business someday, but the things were, weren't just quite right. The economy was down, just not quite right. The economy's up, everybody's in the business. The economy's down, there's not enough money. They need a little bit more research. They, you know, they need another course or something else. They were always talking themselves out of it. The 10% just launched. And here's what they discovered. And they called it, I think it's one of the most important of all business principles. I think it may be in myself. It's called the corridor principle. Is when they launched, 
They started down what they perceived to be a corridor, and at the end of the corridor was business success. So it's like the pile of money. So they started down this corridor, but as they went down the corridor, they found the corridor was blocked, and they couldn't go any further in that direction. But at this point, another door opened to the right or left, and there was another corridor. So they went down that corridor, but that corridor was blocked. But when they hit that block, another door opened to the right or the left, and they took that door, and they kept doing this over and over, like we said, 20 times, 34 times, until finally they hit their goal of business success. And it was always in an area completely different from what they started off on. They had gone through so many different iterations before they found it, and, but they finally found it. The critical thing was that they launched. And if you launch towards your goal, the doors of opportunity will open. The lessons will come. You'll get a block, but it'll be a door will open. You get a block, as nature says, what do they say? That nature, God never closes a door without opening another. All right? So what you do is you keep looking for the open door. And sometimes the product you come up with is so totally different from what you started, but that's the one that makes a jillion dollars. I love it. I love it. Especially because I'm sitting here right now listening to Brian Tracy tell me this. And I'm thinking, two years ago in my business, I never would have imagined that I would be here doing this. I remember sitting, reading your books, and like dreaming of things, and I just launched and started things. And I'm so far from where I ever was then. And I'm sitting here watching you on video being like, wow, this is true. This is it. Like these doors have opened and I've gone through 150 different doors at this point to get to here right now. And it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't have launched at one point and just started. And that's, that's, is the key to success. The guy with the yogurt launched the people with the iPad and the kids instruction system launched everybody who is successful, just launched. Even you go back and you look at the two movies they've made about Steve jobs, where they came up with this idea in a garage and so on. They launched. You look at Hewlett Packard as they started in another garage in what is now in Palo Alto in Silicon Valley. And they just came up with one little machine and launched. And Bill Hewlett made it, and David Packard sold it. And it's <laughs> like a windshield wiper. You've got a, a brain person and a salesperson. But it always, it went back to launching. I love it. I love it. I love it. All right, Brian, this has been an absolute blast. I want to wrap up on one final question for you. So this idea I'm calling the entrepreneurial gap, meaning that as entrepreneurs, as dreamers, we're always projecting our success into the future and setting goals into the future, which we need to do. But from the outside, we're seen as successful oftentimes, but from inside ourselves, we never see ourselves as successful because success is always in the future. Yeah. And like the horizon, as you walk towards the horizon, it always gets further and further away. So you'll set a goal in six months when you launch this book and it hits a certain metric, you'll be successful. Yet right before you hit that goal, you set five bigger goals into the future. And so sometimes we end up in this gap where we just never are, see ourselves as successful no matter what we accomplish. I would love it right now, Brian, if you could stop. You have a long, amazing career behind you at this point, massive, massive successes. But I would love if you could stop right now and turn and look behind you the wins, the losses, the highs, the lows, and tell me how you feel about your entrepreneurial journey up until today. Well, I did not, I did not think about this until I read a, an art, a Harvard Business Review study on the mindset of leaders, including entrepreneurial leaders, is they never use the word failure. It never occurs to them that they failed. People will always ask me, what was your biggest failure and what did you do then? I tell them, I can't think of an answer for your question because I've never failed. I've uh, had lots of twists and turns along the way, but not failed. And then the Harvard study interviewed leaders and they asked them, what do you think about failure? He said, we don't have failures. We have learning experiences. We have expensive learning experiences. We have painful learning experiences, but everything that happens is merely a learning experience. So that keeps them up. Everybody positive and it keeps them focused on the lessons. What can we learn? to be more successful. Like those two examples in the Harvard study today, they had to try 19 different iterations of the business put through before they hit number 20 and hit a billion dollars in sales. The other one had to go 30, 34. Number 34, billion dollars in sales. But if you're not willing to try, learn, try, learn, the rule today is try, is get the idea, try it out, learn, do it again. Just keep repeat and then repeat. Repeat the cycle, three parts, idea, try, learn, and do it again. 
and just keep doing that until like starting up an engine, starting up this, wham, the engine moves. And then everybody says, oh, you were sure lucky to stumble into that business. Are you kidding? You, <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea. So you just smile and say, yes, yes, I was very fortunate. And so I was very blessed to get into this business. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. All right, Brian. Well, we've got to talk about your business in passing, and we've got to talk about your new book, Get Smart, which I absolutely 100% fully endorse in passing. But could you specifically tell the listener where they can go find out more about you, Brian? Well, two things. Buy the book on Amazon, because no, nobody sells books on their website at home anymore. At least we don't. Right. Buy it on Amazon or at Barnes & Noble. But if you come to my website, briantracy.com, there's a free 12-step guide to setting and achieving your goals. And I believe that all success, based on my turnaround experience when I was 23, begins with your sitting down with a piece of paper and writing down your goals and deciding how you're going to achieve them. And this 12-step process I began teaching in 1981, based on taking information from everything I'd read on goals over the years. I've now taught it to more than maybe 2 million people in 38 languages worldwide, this 12-step process. And one of the most common things I ever hear when I travel. I just came back from speaking in Germany, Poland, and Brussels, Bulgaria. And I'm on my way to Brazil tomorrow. And then oh. I'll be speaking. I've spoken in 72 countries. And people come up to me in every country, including these countries, Poland, Germany, Bulgaria, and Italy. I was in Italy also for two days. And they say, you changed my life. You made me rich. You changed my life. Sometimes it's through translation. Or it's Deutsch. You have mine. Uh, you've changed my life, you've made me rich. And I say, what was it? And they all brighten up and they say, it was the goals. And they smile and they beam. And they're so happy. Like they discovered some great treasure. It was when you taught me about goals. And I started to write down my goals. And my whole life is different. People went from rags to riches. I'm one guy, skeptical, cynical as can be took the exercise in the course, write down 10 goals, pick one, work on it every day. That's what all rich people do, by the way. They work on their one big goal all the time. I said, he said, I was very skeptical. I was alcoholic, overweight, just recently divorced and unemployed. And so I said, okay. So I wrote down the 10 goals, picked one and worked on it every day. He said, today, he said, I've got 28 staff. I'm worth $3 million. I've lost 25, 30 pounds. I'm happily remarried. He said, you transformed for my life. That's what I wrote down in your seminar is that I have this amount of money. I have my own business. I have my own staff. I meet a beautiful girl. I lose all that. <laughs> he said, he couldn't believe it because he wrote down the goals. And oh, so, this, I, so, I say, I, so I say to my audience, I say, when we meet again after the seminar, when I come back here in six or 12 months, I want you to come up to me and say the same things. You changed my life. You made me rich. And it's surprising how many people do. They come up and they say, you remember you said that two years ago? Well, it worked. I'm earning five times what I was earning before. You made me rich. <laughs> it was always the goals. That must feel good. Yeah, and that's what we teach in this book. That's one of 10 critical principles that we teach, 10 ways of thinking. All rich people think are intensely goal-focused. They call them hogs. A big, hairy, humong big, hairy, what is it? A hog. Yeah, it's a big, hairy... Ugly big, goal or something? No, obvious goal. I was change, just reading about it. But it's a big goal. Yeah. And they're working on this big goal all the time. They're beehogs. Big, hairy, big, humongous something goal. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So listeners can find that on your, that's under free resources, I believe, on your site. But I will find a link to it and I'll link to that. It's briantracy.com and you click on it and there will they sit down and Brian's free 12-step goal setting. I've had several people I've spoken to on the radio who've clicked it up and you see it right there. It is. It's right there. Yeah, it is. So I'll link to briantracy.com for you or you can find it. And it's very obvious. You can't miss it, but definitely do the 12 step goals. Brian has written over 70 books. His last one is Get Smart. And it is an excellent, excellent, excellent read. I've been reading Brian's books for, I think, 15 years at this point. So thank you so much, Brian, for everything you've ever done. Thank you for everything you're going to continue to do for me and for the world. And thank you for taking time to stop by today. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Wow. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. So I started this show 200 and something episodes ago now, 
almost two years ago with the intention of speaking to this list of 30 people, just smart, brilliant people doing really cool stuff that I wanted to talk to. I didn't think I would get to talk to them if I wasn't hitting record. So I had to figure out how to interview people. And I've spent the past almost two years now in 200 episodes doing just that. And sometimes you get to then speak to people like Brian Tracy. I was trying to get Brian on the show for the last two years, and I've, I, it was hard to get a hold of. But somehow, mysteriously, about two weeks ago, in my mailbox just appeared his latest book and a letter from his PR agent, his new PR agent, with her email address attached. And I was honored. I didn't even know how she got my address. But it was amazing to get his new book, to read it. It was great. It's called Get Smart, and I recommend it. But it was really cool to then just have an email address, send it off, and within like 10 minutes, he was booked for the following week. And I was blown away and honored to get to speak to Brian Tracy today. He's an absolute legend in this space, and he's a very, very smart man who has done a lot of really, really interesting things way before the internet even, and then he's come onto the internet and really taken it to a whole nother level too. And I was, I, I probably... Maybe some parts during it, you could tell that I was pretty excited. <laughs> but it was an excellent conversation. And Brian really opened up, shared a lot with his answers. And I really appreciate that. And so this was Brian Tracy I got to ask some of these questions to, which is amazing and really makes it so worthwhile to me. And I hope that that translates out to you, which I'm sure it does, at least on some sort of level for you. So I had to go back, and it was a pleasure to go back and listen to this conversation again. Actually, I got to watch this conversation. We did this one via video. So that's how Brian likes to do it, and I'm not one to argue with Brian Tracy. So I went back, and I watched it, and I went through all the parts that I had mentioned, and there was eight parts I had to go back and really, really pay attention to. And then I went through, and I actually got it down to three parts. Then I went back, and I got it down to two, and I went back one more time, and this one thing that Brian said, he said this one thing that really, really just kind of hit home with me. Did you get it? Did you hear it? Let's do it. Let's find the hack. The key is to get it 80% right and run with it and then fix it up as you go along. Get it 80% right. And I, up to that time, I was a perfectionist. I wanted it to be absolutely perfectly right before I would launch with it. And that's what most people do is it's ready, 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 aim, 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 never, never fire. And so from then on to this, if I get a good idea for a book, a course, a training program, an audio video, everything else, I get it and run it up the flagpole and get it and get the feedback and get the cannons coming back at you. And then I correct it and run it back up. I correct it and run it back up. Every multi-million dollar successful product I've ever had has been preceded by a whole series of failures. But the key is launch. And that's the hack. Brian, Brian, Brian. This is awesome. And this is so very, very, very key. And I'm so happy that you said this. And there's a lot in here. This isn't as simple as it seems. So as his friend Mark Victor Hansen says, the key is to get it 80% right, run with it, and then fix it as you go. Absolutely true. Because otherwise, as you know, and as Brian said, the longer, like literally by the hour, I honestly believe that a project takes longer than it should to get out the door exponentially does it increase the odds and likelihood of it never seeing the light of day. And that's sad. That's, that tears my heart out inside when you put so much work into something and you just want to perfect it to the point where and then you end up getting distracted and something else gets in the way or life gets in the way and it never goes out. It's like having, I don't know how many authors or quote unquote want to be authors have that half finished book in their drawer per se or in a folder on their computer that just never gets finished because it's just not perfect. So I love this. And I love how Brian then says, he's like, now I get an idea. And as soon as I do, I run it up the flagpole. I've never heard it said like that, but I love that. And then he's like, and get the cannons coming back at you which is like the third brilliant thing in this short statement that he says, which is getting the cannons coming back at you, meaning expect it to not be perfect because it's never going to be perfect. You have to get it out there so that you can get feedback and readjust, right? This is the, 
I can't remember where the quote comes, but the analogy is that when your plane takes off from, say, Miami to fly to Chicago, it, it has to readjust as it's going. The wind picks up and may, might go east to west. And so it's got to realign. Like it doesn't just, you don't ever just take off and however the wind takes you and you just kind of keep going. It's like you're constantly readjusting. That's how this works. To get to Chicago, you know that's where you want to end up, but you have to just constantly realign. And you can't do that until you take off, until you launch. And also know that how, I love how Brian says, none of his projects that have gone on to like multi-million dollar projects now have ever launched without it being a series of failures. And failures, don't take them as like an ending. That's not, that's literally just, you think this is going to work. Feedback tells you no, feedback tells you no, feedback tells you no. And then all of a sudden you have this great product at the end. Oftentimes we launch things, we come up with ideas, and we put them out there and people don't buy them right away. Actually, that's usually how it works until we sort of change the positioning on it until we hit the market properly. The best products in the world do not sell themselves. Some of the worst products in the world get marketed really well and outsell the better products, the whole VCR beta thing. <laughs> it's, it's just how it works. And so you need to know that you are going to put it out there, get those cannons coming back at you, get the feedback and readjust, readjust, readjust. Don't take that as a failure. Don't take that as your product's no good or that you picked the wrong market. Take that as this is a necessary step for you to get from Miami to Chicago dealing with the winds that have now come up. It's just the way it works. And Brian, I absolutely thank you for sharing that with us. All right, that has been an absolute blast. And now that we're on the topic, if you want to be building up that audience of 1,000 true fans, maniacs as I call them, and then learn how to open up a conversation and determine exactly what it is your market wants and then to launch tiny products to them with the sales funnels and everything attached to it, 1000maniacs.com is a new project that I pilot launched back over the Christmas holidays and there was about 30 people that signed up for it and uh, they were my cannons that came back at me and we readjusted the product, moved it, and created something really, 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 really cool that is going to be launching in the next couple of weeks. But 1000 Maniacs, 1000maniacs.com, you can get on the list to be notified about that. I will be doing a series of webinars, sort of walking you through what, what the process is that we're doing and how, yeah, how it's going to help you, how it's going to get you your 1000 Maniacs and then learn how to launch like Brian Tracy. 1000maniacs.com. Get on the list. It's going to be fun. All right. It's been a blast. I thank you so much for joining Brian and I. I Again, I had a blast talking to Brian, and I'm so glad that you decided to spend the time with us today. I really, really, truly do appreciate it. So please, until next time, keep hacking the entrepreneur. <laughs>